Imagine you are a tennis player playing an aggressive game and you develop tennis elbow. Do you want me to choke you to treat you? Imagine you are a patient about to undergo a total knee replacement. Do you want me to choke you to treat you too? Imagine you are an athlete who repeatedly hits themselves in the head on the field. Do you want me to choke you then? Sounds scary, right? No asphyxiation fans in the audience at all? Didn't think so. Well, I'm here to tell you that choking, when done at the right time and the right place, can actually help you recover from an injury, prevent an injury from occurring, and it might even save one of your organs. So I'm a physical therapist, and I've been in practice for about 15 years, primarily in New York City, and I continue to rely on my best and wisest tools, my hands, to help patients recover from an injury. I'm not the kind of therapist that puts you in a corner and says do a bunch of exercises and leaves it at that. I am an involved manual therapist. A manual therapist is someone who uses their hands to facilitate injury recovery using a variety of techniques. Now, as a manual therapist, uh, and one that's appreciated touch in her practice for many years, I started to do what most practitioners would do. I started to recognize patterns in patients' responses to treatment. So um, here's an example. Now, I've used belts in my practice for as long as I can remember. In fact, I still have the very first belt I purchased in 2004. And it was while doing a lateral hip glide, a relatively mundane mobilization technique used to help increase hip mobility that I recognized something. My patients started to describe feeling of pulses on their inner thigh, just where I'd placed the belt. I found this very interesting, and in fact, what I found more interesting is as soon as I released the belt, these patients would describe this feeling of warmth in their leg, a warm surge, and they would say that their hip felt better, and if they had been experiencing knee or ankle pain, they would say that that also felt better too. I mean, they were elated. They had this experience of mysticism associated with what I had just performed. Um, you know, they even called me a witch or a magician. Now, I appreciated the flattery, but as a scientist, I was kind of offended. Um, you know, what was it about this lateral hip glide that was causing these patients to feel better in other areas of their body? And why wasn't there any literature uh, in my PT journals about this blood flow response? So I started to dig. I started to look for answers. And what I discovered I was doing was I was partially blocking or choking, not that kind of choking, but choking somewhere else. I was choking off the blood supply to the femoral artery using my belt. And when I released the belt, these patients felt this reflow of blood and also felt better. Convention will tell you that healing happens when there is this uh, abundance of blood supply, but what I was figuring out was the opposite. Less was turning out to be more. So as a manual therapist, I wanted to figure out if I could do this with my hands, and I could. And I wanted to know if I could do this in other areas of the body. And I was able to do it too in the head, face, the neck, the trunk, areas that are typically hard to occlude with a belt or a tourniquet. Interestingly, my hands became very sensitive to these feel this feeling of restriction of blood flow and this reflow of blood flow uh, through the changes in pulsing. It was kind of in incredible. Now, in my field, there are many techniques that use tourniquets uh, around limbs to uh, block blood flow while a patient is exercising, like doing a bunch of bicep curls, um, in order to increase muscle strength. This is a different technique that requires some vetting by our medical community because patients are actually being occluded while they're exercising. But my methodology and my uh, intention were different. Um, my methodology was using my hands, it was partial, and I was doing these blood flow occlusions briefly, repeatedly, 
with this bloodborne washout phase in between each stroke. And I was seemingly getting these uh, wonderful results. So um, my intention as well was really to not focus on muscle strength. It was really to focus on tissue recovery. And so I developed a full body curriculum training practitioners to use their hands to create these mini occlusive events uh, at different segments of the body, and I called it ICT. Ischemic means to restrict blood flow, conditioning means to train, and technique is a methodology. So let me give you some examples of where we've used ischemic conditioning successfully. So Jane Doe walked into my clinic with painful, swollen, uh, uncomfortable uh, knees, restricted knees, uh, from an exacerbation of Lyme disease. And so what I did is I occluded her femoral artery with my hand uh, at the hip and again closer to the knee, uh, repeatedly, briefly, with these bloodborne washout phases in between, and, um, and this, is, this was her result. So she had improved in a span of four sessions dramatically with a reduction of pain, a reduction of swelling, a reduction of discoloration, so much so that she was strolling out on, in New York City in her shorts because she wasn't shy anymore and she got herself a nice tan. So um, other examples of where ischemic conditioning has worked has been in treating tennis elbow. So we've occluded the radial artery in the forearm uh, to help treat uh, this condition, and we've done so in as little as one session uh, using this occlusive technique. We've also used it to treat uh, a type of orofacial pain called tempor temporomandibular joint dysfunction, or TMD. This condition is associated with clenching or grinding that causes face pain, head pain, neck pain. And what we've done is use this technique with some success. So if you take your two fingers and place it uh, in front of your ear, just on the, in front of the pointed projection called your tragus uh, on your ear, you might feel for the pulse of the superficial temporal artery. Now don't worry if you don't, it's pretty subtle, but let me describe what a practitioner would do. A practitioner would compress the artery, glide their fingers forward to create this mini tourniquet around that artery. We might even put our thumb inside a patient's mouth to increase that compression. And um, we've treated many people, including all that, those New York City grinders that I've treated in the past. So everything I've described so far has been when an injury has already been present. So we performed ischemic conditioning after the injury. Typically when a physical therapist would treat a patient is after the injury has occurred. And we called it ischemic post-injury conditioning or ischemic post-conditioning. But it begs the question on whether or not ischemic pre-injury conditioning exists or ischemic preconditioning. And it turns out uh, that this is where the story gets really interesting. At least it does for me because it's all the research. So uh, it all began in heart research. Now let me remind you what a heart attack is. A heart attack is when you occlude the coronary arteries or the blood vessels to the heart and you know, it's that event that actually causes a heart attack. But what some gutsy researchers did in, uh, in uh, University of Washington and Duke in 1986 is they occluded the blood vessels to the heart as a form of treatment for a future induced heart attack in a canine model. The very thing that was causing the heart attack was being used as a form of treatment for it. And what they found was quite remarkable, that this reduced the amount of injury in the heart by 75%. 75% of the heart didn't die because ischemic preconditioning was performed. So of course these researchers wanted to see if this could be done in other areas, like other organs, and it turned out that it could be done in the brain, in the lungs, in the digestive tract, in the skin, and even in the musculoskeletal tissue, all showing this promise of protection. But is it safe? Can you clinically clamp the coronary artery? I mean, it doesn't sound exciting, does it? nor is it, it must be very difficult to find willing participants to partake in this kind of study. However, 
other researchers in 2002 at Cambridge University and uh, in collaboration with Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto looked at whether or not they could occlude briefly, repeatedly with bloodborne washout phases in between the brachial artery, the artery in the arm to cause this remote effect. And it turned out that it could protect the heart in that study. And they saw that it could be done on the femoral artery and it could protect other organs using the femoral artery as well. Now we don't need to cut patients open. We can use tourniquets and clamps and blood pressure cuffs and maybe one's hands to create this occlusive effect and protect remote organs. And this came to be called remote ischemic preconditioning. Taking that concept of clinical applicability one step further, researchers wanted to look at whether or not you needed to fully occlude an artery. I mean, it is it's got some inherent risks associated with it, but it turns out that partial occlusions work too. Finally, looking at how often one does this um, was also being looked at by researchers, and it turns out the more you could do this, put patients on a dosing schedule, or chronically dose them with ischemic conditioning, would also create a better effect. So how does this all work? Like how, how does blocking the brachial artery or the femoral artery protect a remote organ? Well, it all boils down to that important bloodborne washout phase or that reperfusion phase. So what happens is when you occlude an artery, anti-inflammatory molecules accumulate in the area. And when you release that occlusion, those molecules redistribute through the circulatory system throughout the whole body. And the whole body benefits, including the nervous system, which also impacts this effect. Also, I mean, I don't know about you, but choking is kind of stressful, right? Choking anything is kind of stressful. Well, the body senses the stress and starts to pr protect the body against a future stressful event. It's almost like how a vaccine would work. Brief, repeated bouts of occlusion with these reperfusion phases in between can act as a form of inoculation. So who? Who do we do this on? Do we need to be psychic? to predict a future stressful event? No, I mean, I've already thought of two examples actually, so of course I did. Um, one is an orthopedic example, and one is an example in an organ. So the orthopedic example hits close to my field in the form of total hip and total knee replacements. As a physical therapist, we do something called a pre-op, and what this is is you basically educate a patient about with exercises and information about their future surgery. Wouldn't this become an ideal time to perform ischemic preconditioning as a methodology? Studies are showing that total knee replacements actually um, improve after this type of methodology, and you know you get this reduction of impact of injury and this increase in the response to the anti-inflammatory effects that happen from surgery. That's a, you know kind of an important part to maybe uh, looking at how ischemic preconditioning may be a part of. Uh, the pre-op session. So our organ example, where um, can we predict uh, someone uh, might be at risk of a future stressful injurious event? I don't know, call it just say their brain. Traumatic brain injury or TBI has become the focus of ischemic conditioning studies, specifically CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy with all the extensive media coverage in football that it's been getting. So athletes such as football players, uh, boxers, mixed martial artists, soccer players, and even the military are at incredible risk of uh, predictive organ injury. No single treatment exists right now to help reduce the effects of CTE uh, in these populations. The NIH is currently sponsoring two neuropathological groups to look at this condition and de define some diagnostic criteria. And what they've come up with is that there are these increases in the tau protein, which cause these neurofibrillary tangles in the brain uh, that are really considered the hallmark of the disease. The problem is, is that you have to be dead to diagnose it. It can only be done on autopsy. So the NIH's goal right now is to define diagnostic tools and imaging techniques that can be used to detect CTE in the living, but time is ticking. 
and um, this may take years to develop. Ischemic conditioning is uh, showing itself as a promising method to treat uh, TBI, but further investigations are of course needed. Brief repeated bouts of occlusion with these washout phases in between may be the panacea we need as we struggle to define these diagnostic criteria. Currently, experts agree that it is these chronic, non-traumatic blows to the brain that cause this condition, not one forceful blow to the brain. So perhaps if we instituted a methodology before the injury actually occurs, we could physiologically prime these athletes for uh, protection and prevention. I'm not here to tamper with return to play rules. Those are clearly defined by the CDC. But I am simply here to stand here, showing up here, to talk about uh, football and contact sports with hope and optimism. So anybody here, anybody here can predict whether or not they're at risk of some sort of future uh, injurious event? I mean, maybe you're gonna go sit at your desk tomorrow for 10 hours hunched over a computer, or maybe you're planning to take a hit class on the weekend, or maybe you're gonna go for a run. We are all destined for injury. It is really in our fate. Using ischemic conditioning may be the medicine we all need as we try to treat an injury if it exists and prevent one if it looms. So does anybody here want to get choked? Thank you.